<laughs> uh, 7.010, it's Friday. Again, we're the link where we have uh, DYA CPS Director Melanie Brennan joining us on the, in the K-Wave News Zoom Room. Good morning, Melanie. Good morning. So I had asked you to come on uh, earlier this week, and um, uh, I know that we wanted to kind of bring you on towards the end of the week so we'd have uh, more of an update. Uh, can can we uh, thank you for that? I appreciate it. Also, uh, you want to just start an update on the numbers? What are we? We're slowly whittling down that insane amount of uh, uh, complaints or referrals that we had had during the pandemic. So, as you know, um, there were approximately nine hundred referrals that um, were not addressed, um, and so uh, it. I'm happy to report that today, as of today, well, at the end of the day, I expect that six hundred referrals, a total of 600 will have been addressed. Um, as of Tuesday, I know for sure that 534 referrals had been properly vetted and addressed or um, it, uh, we had moved them to, to actual closure. Uh, can you go a little bit more into that uh, process? So the ones that moved to actual closure, what does that mean? That means that they were properly looked at, um, followed up with, and could be closed. Kids were found to be um, safe. Okay. So, so of the 534, many of them did go um, into investigation. As I've said, um, during the pandemic, many of the cases that did come through that were of a crisis nature were acted upon right away. And so what that left was the other remaining cases that required investigation and further um, action by CPS. So as of Tuesday, 534 cases were acted upon. All right. And then the ones that weren't closed, uh, the status of those? So um, the status of those are they were moved on into investigation and the process is ongoing. Um, and cases that were substantiated have moved to case management. Um, other cases have gone to the family support services where no um, maltreatment was indicated, but linkage to services was required. So for example, um, so for example, if you have um, a case where there's a teen pregnancy, um, but it was consensual, parents are supportive. Um, we just wanted to follow up to make sure that um, that the supportive services were there for the teenage um the teenage that was pregnant. So that would that involve, that was, does that involve like just referring them to maybe public health or whatever pertinent agency um, works with that kind yeah, of? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Um, some cases where um, mandated reporters had to indicate that uh, children were not immunized um, in the amount of time that they were supposed to, those cases were again, um, just followed up on with the clinics that might've reported it just to ensure that uh, the child was properly immunized. Uh, Melanie, and then during this uh, time as you uh, r run down and uh, cross off and follow up all these complaints, um, do you continue to receive new complaints? And how does that affect um, that process that's already going with the backlog? So, um, you know, that's a really good question. What we did was um, initially we had started on the backlog, but we realized like, well, we're gonna create another backlog if we're not properly addressing the new cases. So we basically split the DYA social workers and the CPS social worker kind of in half um, after we got, and this was right after we received the assistance of the CPS retirees. So we have six CPS retirees. And if you don't mind, you know, I just kind of wanna give a quick shout out um, to the CPS retirees. There are six of them that come in um, they volunteer, they're not getting paid anything. And they vet these cases, they prioritize, they kind of tell us which ones need to go out on immediately. And um, that is what we do. So we're not only addressing the backlog, we're addressing the incoming cases so that they're acted upon as mandated by law. So if it comes in as a crisis, we're out there that same day. Um, for those cases where um, we can go out within 24 hours or 72 hours, we're doing that. So there is no backlog. Oh, okay. There is no car. Uh, I wanted to, man, and uh, you know, just a little advisory, guys. I'm about to read something that's uh, very disturbing. So if you don't want to, um, it's a magistrate's uh, complaint that we received uh, yesterday. 
Um, and I'll just go ahead and uh, go into it from the Superior Court of Guam. Um, and this is the magistrate, which uh, comes from Assistant Attorney General Christine Santos Tenorio. Uh, on December 22nd, 2020, at approximately 429 uh, p.m., a local teacher reported to Dedido Precinct Command that one of her female uh, students, a 16 year old uh, identified only by the initials, had been sexually assaulted by uh, Ketret Pakyu, the defendant, since the um, female student was six or seven years old. Uh, the student is blind and has special needs. Uh, the student indicated to her teacher that the last sexual assault had occurred on December 20, 2020. Uh, the student, again, who is blind and has special needs, lives in the same household as the defendant, the student, remained in the house with the defendant because authorities say that they could not locate uh, the student. On February 25th, 2021, CPS workers accompanied the student to the Dedido precinct where that the student told officers that the defendant had sexually assaulted her again on February 22nd, 2021. On that day, the student was laying down on her bed when the defendant laid down next to her. The defendant then touched Eni's breast and buttocks. The defendant then pulled down her panties uh, and raped her or so um and the student again who was blind and has special needs was very emotional during the this is just so heartbreaking uh ketrat pacquiao uh charged with attempted third degree criminal sexual conduct the three counts of fourth degree criminal sexual conduct uh but melanie you know we talked about during the pandemic We talked about during the pandemic when we didn't have school, and that's where most of these reports come from, as you can see. Um, so I, I just don't know, was this one of the complaints that was lodged with CPS that wasn't followed up on during the pandemic, or was this situation just, um, did it just get you guys' attention with the December incident? So um, I have you know, uh, obviously, I, I can't really discuss what, you know, what occurred during the pan pandemic. I can't, I can't tell you if, in fact, this was one of those cases. But I will tell you that um, CPS is involved at this point, and it's because of cases like this where, you know, DYA, as the DYA director, I honestly um, know that the system we need to do better, and that we will be involved with CPS for a while moving forward because I believe that, you know, it, you know, the, the evolution of CPS and, and, and what happened, I believe it, um, it was, you know, it had occurred these, this type of thing had occurred even prior to the pandemic. Yeah. And, um, I know that, you know, it's as complex an issue as child abuse uh, is. And so we are in it for the long haul and, we are aware of other instances like this. They're all tragic. They're all heartbreaking. And that is the very reason why um, we are there. And th that is the very reason why there is an emergency at this point. Since we've been there, again, we have, um, you know, revealed, we have opened up some cases that required um, kids to be removed from their homes. And so I, I want to say even in this week alone, there was over 11 kids that we've had to place because they were in harm's way. And I will say that they, you know, that there were multiple referrals um, prior to this. And so we are working really, really hard, Chris, on, on trying to, uh, to prevent this from happening. Can, and I know without going into too much uh, detail, because obviously this is a very um, sensitive matter that is still under investigation, but um, so uh, December uh, officers from GPD went to um, this young girl's house um, and they weren't able to find her. So what happened between December and February? That's two months. Uh, February 25th, CPS workers accompanied the girl to Dedito Precinct. So in that, in that two-month window, were you guys made aware of the uh, complaint at the time GPD had gone to look for the uh, girl? And then if you could walk us through, in, in what ways that you can, walk us through what happened between in those two months. Because that's two months I, where, I think, where I'm assuming the girl, you know, I mean, is there with the, the let. Oh, God. I can, I can only say that once we were made aware of it, um, we acted upon it. And it was considered a crisis, meaning they acted upon it as soon as they found out. 
what happened prior to us coming in. And because it ca this case is so recent, I really don't know the details in that, but I do know that once it came in, that we became aware of it, we did act upon it as a crisis, as it should be done. And I, I mean, I just want to commend the, the teachers who are, you know, with that with that face-to-face, -face, um, I mean, I just can't even wrap my mind around uh, this young lady, you know, sharing that with her teacher. I mean, I'm so glad that she did because it led to, you know, th this intervention. And But are you, with the 11 kids that you had to take away from their parents and any other issues, are you getting a lot of those um, complaints and referrals from other teachers in the school system who are starting to see the kids more maybe now that we're doing some kind of face-to-face? I will say that um, if if the teachers uh, reported it during the pandemic and um, because of PCOR 3 and having face-to-face, -face, it has um, prompted teachers to re-report cases that we are acting on as we speak. And like I said, it's so important that um, we act on the new referrals and they not be backlogged. Um, that you know that is our one of our primary goals to make this system more efficient and to follow the mandate of the law uh, there these cases are, are really really difficult and and i know that um cps was still working during the pandemic they were working on these crisis cases and i think what's important to note is that even if something comes in as you know an educational neglect um a parent isn't you know ensuring that their kids are going to school, even though it seems minor, we still need to follow up. We still need to um, go out because many times the reasons are so varied as to why, but oftentimes it leads to other um, indications of maltreatment, such as sexual abuse. And so it's so important that every referral is treated as a, as a child in need. And moving forward, it is with that thought in mind that the social workers um, review these referrals um, that, that's good to hear uh, Melanie uh, so what are, where are we with the hiring of uh, the needed staff that I remember last time you're on you're you're saying that there's some definitely uh, vacancies that need to get filled yeah there there are and again you know I, I had said that there are as many um, vacancies I think there's actually more vacancies within child protective services than there are warm bodies. At this point, I um, I will say that we will be onboarding two new social workers next week. Um, they'll be joining the retirees, they'll be joining DYA and the CPS social workers to help uh, address both um, the backlog and the incoming new cases that come in. Um, it has been a challenge, Chris. A lot of people, a lot of social workers even, uh, really don't care for the, the dangerous and um, difficult work of child protection. And so um, we've interviewed so many, and I want to say that so far we've gotten like two bites. Um, we continue, we'll continue to try and recruit both through the unclassified route and through the classified route, but it has been a struggle. And so again, uh, DYA, we, we believe that we'll be there, we'll be at CPS for the long haul. I wanted to go back because um, it had come up. We interviewed uh, the president-elect of the National Association of Social Workers, Guam chapter, uh, Terrell and Francisco, and and she had um, um, what it was just kind of someone called, and we ended up going off on and talking about the whole CPS uh, issue. But uh, can you tell us with the person who was responsible for? Um, taking the referrals and the complaints. Was there any type of uh, administrative or disciplinary action that was taken against the employee for allowing those uh, complaints and referrals to file or to just pile up? Or so, so the um, CPS continued to receive the referrals. The intake worker um, did his did the preliminary assessment as expected. The bottleneck occurred um, at the supervisory level and and was, you know, um, pushing them out to case assignments, to case investigations. That's where the backlog is. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to push the cases through so that they're properly investigated. We're trying to push them through so that 
if it is substantiated that there is a case manager helping with this child and the family. Um, that's the normal process. That's the route it's supposed to take. The, the bottleneck occurred at um, case assignments. And so that is something um, that is being dealt with administratively. Um, I can't go into the details. I, um, it was over a prolonged period of time. And so it involved, um, you know, a few personnel. I, I heard that there was like a forced retirement or something. Um, I'm not sure about that. Uh, my focus has been on the backlog. My focus has been on children that need to be um, protected, children's cases that need to be investigated. Uh, the disciplinary action will occur, um, but again, that is you know a personnel matter, and I'm not right. able to speak on that. But I, I I will say that Child Protective Services has been overwhelmed for such a very long time. And it really has impacted because of the high turnover rate, the burnout rate, it has impacted um, the social workers that are there, their mental health and their efficacy as social workers. And so I think that, you know, it, it was, it's a perfect storm. I mean, there are just so many areas where we can do better and we will do better. And so that that's my focus really on getting us to a place where the public has confidence that if they make a complaint that it is properly looked at and taken care of. That's great to hear, Melania. That's definitely where the focus should be is on the kids. Uh, anything in, in closing that you want to uh, put out before we let you go? Well, you know, now that we're addressing oh, oh, the backlog. Oh, I'm sorry. I had, sorry, sorry, sorry. I had one more. Uh, what about uh, CPS involvement in this case where uh, GPD had found a bunch of people smoking ice around the six month old baby, having baggies of ice around the six month old baby. Uh, wh what was the extent of the CPS involvement in that case? You know, I can't speak to case specifics, but I will say that in cases of parental substance misuse where CPS is called into, they do the preliminary assessment. And if children need to be removed in, in such instances as that, they have been removed. Okay. So that's your way of saying that without saying that it was taken care of. Yes. Oh. And, and I honestly, I, I, I really do want to, um, to indicate that because of our involvement, more and more children have, you know, for safety reasons have been removed. And so um, if there are uh, all of the foster homes pretty much are, are, um, up, <laughs> I think they've reached their maximum capacity. And so, um, did we were able to license one additional foster home this week and so um <clears throat> but one is is so few compared to the many that we need to um to place that we will have to place and so um if anyone is interested in becoming a foster parent or just wants to know more about it please call 475-2653 thank you so much uh, melanie and and uh, again if you want to clue us in with the foster uh parent folks we can get on uh get them on um are okay. you able are you able before i let you go sorry because sabrina sent me some questions uh can you talk about the cottage uh homes that given to guam behavioral cottage homes given to guam behavioral okay um so what what that is is um it's the cottage homes the is in talifofo and that was um uh that was, I guess, last used in 2015 for kids charged with status offenses. Um, since that time, though, uh, they had stopped using it. The numbers got smaller, and there was also some infrastructure damage to that cottage homes in Talafofo. Um, after that, I guess the previous administration had rented out a home closer to DYA, which was um, um, a residential setting. But that residential setting had some plumbing issues. And what was happening was um, the kids had to be moved into a dormitory within the DYA complex. But it was a dormitory that had been vacated because of you know, juvenile justice efforts that kind of reduced the population of incarcerated youth. And so that dormitory was kind of uh, renovated to look like a residential setting. And that was used for the smaller population. The Talafofo homes in, um, well, the Talafofo cottage homes 
was dilapidated. It needed renovation and it was, you know, it, it was bigger than what was needed for DYA's purposes. Um, and so there is currently ongoing communication for uh, it to be turned over to Guam Behavioral Health and Wellness. So for, I believe, a residential substance use uh, treatment center and uh, where it will better serve the, the public. Thank you, Melanie. You're welcome. All right. Any more questions? <laughs> uh, Sabrina, last call. All right. No, we no further questions, Your Honor. <laughs> Have a good weekend, and, okay. and thank you. I appreciate the uh, tenacity uh, with which you're working through this unfortunate uh, situation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and, and again, if you know anybody who wants to be a foster parent, do you have my number? Um, and anybody who's interested in working in uh, protective services, please share my number. I'm happy to entertain them anytime during the weekend as well. Thank you, Melanie. You're very welcome. All right. So, yeah, that's uh, Melanie Brennan. The, uh, she's the DYA director. There's a state of emergency at Child Protective Services. Uh, the governor appointed her to um, lead CPS through this uh, state of emergency. And 